Joining me on Kaleidoscope Ears tonight is Tony Butler from Big Country, all the way from London. Welcome to the program, Tony. Oh, good evening. How are you? Yeah, well, thank you. Very well. Kaleidoscope Ears listeners would know how much of a Big Country fan I am. We play you all the time on the program. 2007, you reformed with Bruce and Mark for a, for a 25th anniversary tour. What motivated you to do that? Um, a lot of peer pressure, actually. <laughs> um, it's kind of... I Since uh, Stuart's... Uh, untimely passing, I kind of really divorced myself from uh, the music industry and really kind of thought, well, you know, I've been very lucky. I've played in a very, very special band, you know, for, a, you know, over a 25-year period. And, you know, we really did, you know, we had a great um, sense of worth and being and everything we did wasn't just your normal rock and roll band thing. You know, we really did think that we had something very special. And I just didn't think that there was anything to be done afterwards, really. And I thought to myself that if I'm going to do anything, I need to find a new challenge in life. So um, I decided to become a teacher. You know, I've taken so much out of the business, I decided to put some something back in in that particular way. And then, uh, say, 2006, I was beginning to get sort of people talking about um, reunion this, do this, do that. And um, I finally succumbed in 2007 because of the 25th anniversary aspect. And I thought, well, you know, it'd be a nice way for us to pay homage to the band and to Stuart. But uh, I decided if we were going to do it, I didn't really want to get involved with anybody else. And we'd just kind of do it with the three of us, which was which should also be a challenge, because uh, to actually just do it as a three-piece would have... I think it made us feel better about doing it, uh, as opposed to doing it any other way. So um, we did. We got into a rehearsal room. Played some of the old songs. I sung some of the songs. Bruce sung some songs, and it was great. So we decided to do it seriously and uh, put together a few dates to celebrate the 25th anniversary, and that went so well. You know, we decided to, you know, as we normally did as a team, we just wrote some more material, of which we recorded, which transpired to be the uh, BBWEP. That's the main thing we're here to talk about tonight. But going right back to the beginning, uh, just for a few minutes, you were playing with the Pretenders. Yeah in the yeah. early 80s. What, that's uh, right. what made you decide to join Big Country over the Pretenders? God, that's a long time ago now. Yeah, uh, what, well, basically, um, the catalyst was uh, a record producer called Chris Thomas, who um, I'd worked with um, on Pete Townsend albums. And because uh, he was the Pretenders producer, um, uh, the unfortunate, again, the unfortunately un- untimely death of their guitarist and bass player they were scheduled to make a record and um, Chris asked me if I wanted to, to work on the record which was uh, Back on the Chain Gang and I, I jumped at the chance because I was a great Pretenders fan but just at that time I just joined Big Country Big Country were a kind of band that I've always wanted to be with I mean I had great respect for Stuart's guitar playing and um, you know the, the idea of forming a group to play the kind of music that we did was really appealing but when I had the opportunity to work with Chrissy you know I had a big dilemma because I, I really admired and adored Chrissy, and, and to, to work with him was just a dream come true. But I, I kind of got the feeling that my options and opportunities, and you know, if we were going, if I was going to do something special with my life within a group context, I, I kind of felt it would be better off with Big Country. And I think, from my personal point of view, you were absolutely right too. Um, <laughs> it was a gamble. Yeah, and uh, one that uh, I believe paid off anyway. Yeah. You were going to come to Australia during the 80s. What happened with that tour? Why was it cancelled? <laughs> well, I think because of the way that things started off with the band in terms of popularity. I mean, the Crossing album became... I mean, not only did it sort of hit big in Britain, but it became big in America as well. We found ourselves in America quite a lot. And, and I think around that time, 1983, 84... I mean, we were just continually touring and um, wearing ourselves out, basically. And we were scheduled to uh, come to Australia and the, mid- and the Far East. And I think we got as far as uh, Japan. And uh, we hit and we started doing some Japanese dates. And uh, basically, fatigue, exhaustion, and uh, unmeasurable amounts of alcohol consumption got the better of a couple of us. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think the whole thing kind of fell apart and, you know, basically it was a band who were completely, you know, on their knees by that time. Uh, so we postponed the Australian leg and never really got an opportunity to come back. And we did come back to make you a did. video. You did. I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> uh, a couple of videos, Which is actually. very bizarre. 
uh, for the for the Peace in Our Time album. That's right. Yeah. Why didn't you do some some co- some gigs while you're out here then? Well, it's just the way that things were scheduled at the time. I mean, we the, the decision to go out to Australia to make the videos was um, a quickly taken decision. Pure and simply, it was because of the availability of, direct, of the director, which is one of your beloved directors, Richard Lernstein. And I think we just had a kind of window to go and work with him, which meant that there wasn't really enough time to, to organise anything else. And uh, and as usual with record companies, they put together promotion, promotional things. And so by the time we finished the video, we were back in Europe promoting... Oh, in fact, we were back in America promoting the album. And uh, we also had this big... Um, Russian thing going on at the same time so um, going out to Australia to make a video wasn't really the greatest of ideas but uh, if we wanted to work with Richard we had to. Looking back on the 80s what would what would the biggest uh, highlight of the 80s uh, big country period be for you? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was all such a special time it was, I mean it was a whirlwind time for the band uh, you know to, to be you know we weren't the most commercial of, of bands but for the music to be regarded in such commercial terms was a big buzz for us. The fact that uh, you know we knew that we were good players, we know we knew we put on a good show. Touring was immense, and uh, you know the whole experience really, really kind of gave us you know a real sort of motivation to to try and do the best we can. And you know people kept on allying us with you know bands like Simple Minds and and you two in, in terms of bands who are with world domination or that kind of stuff. That didn't really mean very much to us, but I think. You know, because of events during the band's history, you know, we just didn't we didn't find it that necessary to go down that road. So, you know, we just did what we did when we did, and uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a fun trip. It's a long time. I see two distinct periods in Big Country's history. There was the eighties, and there yeah. was the nineties, which was a, a, a truly distinctive period. First of all, can I just ask why did Mark leave? Um, you're asking me questions. I'm digging into the depths of my mind to try and remember. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, we we got to a point where every band gets to where you know people either are getting bored of doing things or things are not going in particular ways that people want to, and and also I mean, shit was going through. I mean, one of the things that I think has been quite reasonably well documented now is the fact that throughout the, our whole period, Stuart suffered with alcoholism. And there were things going on in his life which weren't making him function as well as we all wanted it to. And there came to, came a point where basically, I think we we all kind of thought, well, we should give it a break and have a rest. And, and Mark was specifically getting disillusioned because we weren't doing as much as he thought we should be. So he actually left for a while. And in the interim, you know, we carried on and, you know, we got some session drummers in and, you know, we made, made an album or two. Uh, and that infused with... Um, kind of record company complications you know that particular period was wasn't the greatest period for the band although creatively you know we still put the same effort into the music um, yeah. there were a lot of things against us yeah i know there's some hidden gems from the 90s period it's particularly since you've released those rarities albums um over the last yeah. 10 years or so the no place like home sessions were f- absolutely fantastic well um, it's, it's funny because um, i remember doing the demos for those particular tracks and thinking that you know i mean every time we went into an album project it was you know it's one of the greatest aspects that a lot of people never ever see because when we sat down to do new material it's a great aspect of the band which you know, we, we we all thoroughly loved but it all went wrong with our relationship with with our record company at the time you know we didn't either, we weren't either getting the support or you know the feedback was really very negative or you know we were being asked to work with producers that we didn't particularly feel comfortable with and you know it was a very sort of heavy political scene at the time which ended up us parting company from phonogram records um, which was maybe the best thing to happen to us. But again, it, it all contributed to the sort of what I think people regard as a lean period. It culminated with uh, Buffalo Skinners, which was produced by yourselves, wasn't it? Yeah, that was um, because we kind of got together with the guy who originally signed us to Phonogram Records, a guy called Chris Briggs. Um, he started his own label, uh, which was uh, pro- uh, through Chrysalis Records. And um, having him back on board... You know, he was a very big motivating force for us as a band. And um, again, you know, we, the material that we were writing and putting together at that time was kind of really reflecting how we were all feeling musically. I know, I remember specifically myself and Bruce really feeling as though that we wanted to get back to making guitars, you know, loud and proud again. Yeah. And uh, 
you know, Stuart was kind of, Stuart's writing was leaning on to more and more to the countryside and the softer side, but he kind of realized that, you know, we, we were still essentially a rock band. And so when we put the Buffalo Skinners together, we really decided that it was going to have, you know, a harder edge to it. And, you know, the quality of the songs would be as, still as deep and melodic as, as normal, but they'd just have a harder edge sound. And having, um, I can't, I'm sorry, I f- temporarily forgot the guy's name, but the guy we had playing drums with us was uh, Simon. He was phenomenal. I mean, I've worked with him before, but he was phenomenal on drums on that album. And uh, the whole thing just felt like we'd rejuvenated and re-motivated. And, you know, the Buffalo Skinners, I think, was still one of my favourite albums. So I guess I guess through the 90s, um, you guys didn't get the airplay and the promotion you really deserved because there, there really was some gems in that period. What, yeah. What, what are the highlights for you? I, I guess the last album, um, Driving to Damascus, you were working with um, Ray Davies on a, on a few of the tracks. Did you have much to do with him or was that just mainly a, a, a to do with Stuart? Well, what happened was um, Ray Davies apparently was watching TV one night and saw, saw the band doing an acoustic uh, session and he was scheduled to play at uh, Nebworth. So he got in touch with our management and asked if there was a chance of him teaming up with us to do some acoustic stuff, which obviously we jumped at the chance. And for us as members of Big Country, getting to play with Ray Davis playing kink songs and him playing Big Country songs was just awesome. And, uh, you know, the relationship just grew from there. And um, he and Stuart went to New York and wrote some songs. And we spent some time out in Nashville writing songs. And, you know, when we came back to record that album, there was a great sort of rejuvenated spirit for the band, and you know we had a you know we had everything kind of in place to really bring the band back with a, a real bang, and the material was there, the album was fantastic, and then it went really badly wrong. We released the first track, Fragile Thing, and British Radio were playing it big style, but um, the uh, the people who compiled the charts decided that some of the packaging didn't conform to their uh, to their um, regulations and basically what looked like a top 30 chart entry ended up charting at somewhere around 70 which killed everything yeah i, rem- I remember that uh, you remember how, that, how did yeah. that affect um the morale of you guys as a band uh, basically it destroyed us it did completely yeah i mean we just thought that you know uh, our midweek predictions were top 30, you know, with, you know the, the, the record was getting the respect it was due, it was a great record, we, uh, we had, um, you had the girl Reader. from yeah. Eddie Reader on it, and you know, the whole thing was fantastic, it was a great song, but because of this technicality, um, uh, it just it didn't do what it was supposed to do, and basically it completely, I mean, completely destroyed it, so I know Stuart went back to America vowing never to come coming back to Britain. Is that right? Yeah, and it, it was an uphill struggle from then on. Is that what led to you guys naming your, your, your next tour the final fling? Yeah, because I think by this time Stuart had enough. Um, yeah. He'd had enough of the band, he'd had enough of stuff. There was stuff going on in his personal life which which um, made him relocate to to America. And it was always going to be tough to run a band with people living, you know, like 6,000 miles apart from each other. It was bad enough when I lived you know, down south of England, and they lived up in Scotland. But somebody actually living in Nashville was going to be really bad. So mm. we decided to, to, to take a break, basically. We decided to, we'll do the final tour and really sort of have a good time doing it and then stop and regroup at another another time. But unfortunately, that never happened. So it wasn't too long after that that Stuart passed away. How did you um, personally and, and the band uh, deal with his uh, passing? Um, well, I can't really comment on how the other guys, because we, I mean, just before the final fling, I mean, myself and, <coughs> excuse me, myself and Stuart decided that we were going to call the band, you know, call it call halt on the, on the proceedings. I mean, I physically left the band. I just said that I'm not going to do this until either things get better or attitudes change or, you know, in, in Stuart's case, until he got himself together. It was a conscious decision to stop. And I hadn't had any contact with him for about a year. And then I got the news that he passed away. So I actually didn't see him. But, I mean, I was hearing reports from lots of people, you know, saying how his physical condition was deteriorating and, you know, he was looking really bad and so on and so forth. And this is all, you know, alcohol-related stuff. So it, Was it right that he'd gone missing once before for, for a period? Um, yeah, but, I mean, again, uh, that's a, a story that kind of got blown out of proportion. But, yeah, as that um, no, he's... I mean, we we decided that we weren't going to be doing much anyway, so 
But I think uh, we were just invited to do some very big shows of which, you know, it didn't happen because we can, he wasn't to be found. And, you know, he just wanted to be away and alone and sort of try to reorganize his life. And, you know, it wasn't any big deal. I mean, the, the, the plan was that, you know, a few years off and then get together and see if we wanted to play to again. But, uh, you know, his life went in another direction, which was unfortunately maybe quite a sour one. So. Yeah, absolutely. And when I got the news that he passed away, you know, obviously it's not what you want to hear. Uh, absolutely not, after spending such a long time together in a, in a working relationship. Um, yeah, I mean, we were a very close-knit unit. You know, we were a bunch of pals, and, you know, we were never, you know, when we were just together as people, you know, we were a bunch of guys, you know, like any other bunch of guys kicking about doing something that they all enjoyed. We were never a cynical, musical entity that did everything with business and making money behind it. You know, we did what was completely natural to us, and yeah. that's what made it so valid to us. So it was, uh, it was a few years uh, later, and you guys got together. It was only in 2007 for the 25th yeah. anniversary tour. And there, after that tour, there was, there was talk of a new uh, album and a single, uh, yeah. which ultimately became five songs. Why just the five songs? Why not a full album? Well, we, we started putting the, the songs together. We'd, um, we'd been put together with this uh, really nice guy, um, producer guy called uh, Pete Brown, who's the son of the legend, legendary Joe Brown. And, you know, we found we got a really good working situation. We all adopted new roles. I mean, I mean, I was at that time, I, you know, just really got very enthusiastic about it and started writing a lot of songs myself and Bruce was writing stuff. And we were beginning to sort of re-sculpt the identity of just the three of us. And we started recording material as just the three of us. If it continued on that path, I think, you know, we might have seen more more tracks recorded and and more enthusiasm for the project. But we were also being told that if we were going to really make it work, then we'd have to get a little bit too cynical about things, which would mean bringing in other people, you know, not somebody to replace Stuart, but bringing in another name person to give it a kind of super group kudos and stuff like that. And uh, to be honest, I just wasn't in interested. I just said, no, I see that we do as a three piece. I'm not bothered. I'm not interested. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not a career rock star. Yeah. I do things because I want to do it. And to get somebody else in a, in a cynical way just to make, you know, the name or rejuvenate the name Big Country as a commercial entity was just something I wasn't, wasn't happy about entertaining. I think that'd, but be, if we were, that'd be staying true to Stuart's philosophy too, yeah? <laughs> well, as I say, Stuart's philosophy was the band's philosophy. And, you know, if we were... If somebody said, "Well, look, you just guys finish finish an album with just the three of you," and I think that might have that might have happened, but also we were having some problems about um, what to do with the name as well. Yeah, it was going. You're going to Which, release it under Big Country, weren't you? But uh, that changed. We were because we we thought we had every right to do that, but um, there were news, there were mentions that uh, that may be a problem. So, in order to not to make it a problem we decided to call it bbw and simply because that's who it was <laughs> that's something very much to do with the title of the, of the ep in our name but essentially to anybody who knows it's big country but it's big country without Stuart. and to be honest i never want to engage in a band called big country where you know Stuart is kind of substituted or replaced in any way i won't you know out of courtesy to his memory i, I just wouldn't do that i'd much rather be a new something new anyway yeah well it's been tried before and it hasn't really been that successful with other bands so uh... no it's, i mean it's it's just the whole idea of big country in the first place it wasn't a cynical um uh, uh, exercise in becoming famous and earning lots of money it was about a bunch of guys getting together to make music and being very compatible doing it and i think what myself mark and bruce felt is that we still had that compatibility but just the three of us but in a, in a music industry cynical way, it wasn't going to reap the rewards as quickly as some people thought it should be. And that, that, that's certainly not my philosophy. I have no interest in that. Yeah. Now, speaking about a couple of the tracks on the EP, Time So Wild, that seems to be a reflection on the, of the past and the, and the fantastic it is. that you had. And yes, uh, definitely. in our name, that seems to be a, a pretty cynical look at the, at the world in some ways. Um, yeah, um, 
Can you tell I mean, me a little about the, the process and, and, uh, of writing those new tracks? And did you collaborate much with Bruce and Mark on those? Well, those particular tracks, I mean, I kind of wrote myself, but uh, obviously as we used to with a band, you know, we take ideas and we, we arrange stuff and rework it and put it together so it really fits everybody's characters and personalities. But lyrically, I mean, I, I mean since in this interim time, I mean, I've done a couple of solo albums myself, and I, re I mean, I recently, um, I say recently, about nine, about five, six years ago, I, I wrote an album called um, Life Goes On, which was basically, you know, it was a cathartic exercise for me to say that, you know, you know, I, I love Stuart dearly and I miss him, and but you know, we've all got to kind of forge ahead. And when I started writing lyrics for that album, I just found myself thinking that I've, I can, I can develop a, a lyrical style. So I wanted to write a song about the band, how we felt, and how fantastic it was to be in that situation, which culminated in Time So Wild. Yep. And, you know, when I look back at it, you know, I'm a very straight, down-to-earth person. I come from humble backgrounds, and everything that's happened to me in the band has been absolutely astonishing, and I feel very lucky and privileged to have lived that life. Yep. And I wanted to reflect that in the lyrics, and, and I knew that the lyrics would have will be very sympathetic to how Mark and Bruce would want to ex express their feelings about what we'd engaged in. And uh, so I was, I was very pleased with the way that that lyric came out. And in, in my name was just really, you know, as we always did, you sit down in front of the, uh, the TV and you watch the news, and a lot of us just didn't feel very comfortable with what, what, would, what was going on uh, in this kind of world affairs, people going out to different countries and getting themselves killed because they're supposedly protecting us and, with, and you know, people weren't specifically asking us. You know, I, I certainly don't want, you know, young families of young soldiers who go out to foreign countries and get themselves killed and come back to people saying, well, they've done it in order to protect the way that I live. You know, I'd like to have a say in that. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think there's going to be any more material recorded with Bruce and Mark? <clears throat> um, not in the foreseeable future. <laughs> um, Basically, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's something that will always be under discussion. It's, the, the door is never closed. Uh, I mean, I've recently gone through a very trying sort of personal situation, which has made me kind of very much not be involved physically myself in music, but I'm sort of being tempted into it again through various means. Our fans um, will always be on your back, Tony. <laughs> yeah, they always will be. But, um, you know, there, there may be things happening which might bring things together. I mean, there's so many... The, the one thing that's really weird about it is that, you know, myself and Bruce and Mark are all getting on in years, and, you know, we've all got different things going on in our lives, and to tie things together to make it work for everybody, it gets more and more difficult as time goes on. But, you know, if something happens which kind of feels good for us to do, then I'm sure we'll do it. I mean, the one thing about Mark and Bruce and I is the fact that our friendship will be forever, and, it, you know, it will never die. But maybe it might not be the right thing to do at the time. But, uh, you know, we're, we're disappointed that we couldn't see the BBW thing further. Because, to be honest, I mean, I know each, each one of us has got a lot more material that we had ready to record, but we never got a chance to get around to, to doing it. Yeah, great shame. Uh, you mentioned your yeah. solo material uh, as well a little earlier. Any plans for yeah. anything, uh, any other solo stuff? Not at the moment, because uh, as I said earlier on uh, in our conversation, I, I got into teaching big style, and um, I work for some colleges. I work in higher education. So you're and teaching I music, really are you? Teaching music? Yeah, I, I, teach, I teach music industry production and technology. So I'm really, everything that I've done in my life, I'm now teaching, which is fantastic. And uh, it's, uh, it makes me feel very good about what I do, and... The students that I teach uh, are certainly benefit, benefiting from my experience. But um, and, I'm, and as with every teacher, you know, you're, you're continually furthering your own qualifications. I'm currently doing a master's just now myself. So sitting down and writing songs is very difficult when you're filling your head with academic nonsense. A lot of other things to do. Now, yeah. the, the internet has been an amazing tool in bringing big country fans together worldwide. Uh, I mean, you're yeah. talking to me on the other side of the world in Tasmania, Australia, and uh, fans are continuing to support big country to this day. Is there anything you'd like to say to the fans? They'll be listening. All I'd love to say, and I do mean love in the biggest sense, is the fact that we cannot, cannot express our 
um, feelings about how we, well we've been supported, not only during the times when <coughs> the band was actually active, but you know, in these long years of inactivity as well. I mean, it's it's extraordinary. Um, it's I think maybe in that way we're one of the luckiest bands in the world. We still are a band, although we're not actually doing anything. We're a band of brothers. We're a band of people who will always be indelibly linked with this experience that we've all shared. And I can only say thank you and how brilliant. And I hope they've you know, got as much out of it as we have. And uh, as I said, it's not maybe not over yet, but if it's not over yet and we come back and do something, it, it will be our intention to make, make it as worthwhile and as fantastic it has been in the past the only difference is Stuart won't be here to share it with us I've been asked by a couple of fans to uh, there, there's a apparently a fan gathering happening in Liverpool in a couple of weeks time you're going to be there um to be honest I didn't know about it <laughs> well you do now yeah, you're going to go up there I know about it um I, I, I think the date that it's actually on I'm actually doing another gig with some friends of mine <laughs> oh, so on that particular night yeah no uh, uh, every now and again um uh, again because when you're working within uh the educational area that I'm in um, you know every now and again I get involved with either some jam nights or blues nights or pick up nights and I've got a few colleagues here who I've been playing some very very <coughs> good old fashioned rock music with and uh, we got a little gig going on somewhere so I'm not going to be able to make that gathering but uh, I'll obviously send a message to the guys out there and uh, again thank them for their interest and so on and so forth but uh, again when it's time to do something properly, I'll get fully engaged. Tony Butler, thanks very much for joining us on Kaleidoscope Ears. It was brilliant, and thank you for taking any trouble to, to talk to me about it.